you're watching Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm DeSoto Brown. I am the host of this program, which is called How Did We Get Here, in which we talk about history, stories from the past, stories from Hawaii's history, to figure out how things in the past affect us today, and to think about also, do we like where we are today? How did we get to these places? Well, this is what we're going to be talking about. I work at Bishop Museum here in Honolulu. I am the Bishop Museum historian, and I'm also the curator for the archives department. What I'm going to be showing you today, however, has no connection to Bishop Museum because everything in this slide presentation is from my personal connection. So what I'm going to focus on right now is how certain products and how certain packaging for products has made use of Hawaiian culture, Hawaiian language, Hawaiian scenery to commercialize and help sell what these products are. Now, in some cases, this use of Hawaiian material or Hawaiian-ness is justified because the objects or the foods or the products were made here in Hawaii. So that's what we're starting with today. And in, in this first view, what you're looking at first, on the left are two paper labels that would have been glued to bottles of soda. And these bottles of soda came from the Liberty Bottling Works in Wahiawa. So it was perfectly reasonable for them to use the word aloha in aloha punch. It was reasonable for them to use an image of a surfer for highball punch for selling its soda, its flavored soda, to local people because these were not, this soda wasn't being exported anyplace. It was just for people on Oahu. And there were a lot of small bubbling companies at that time that were in competition with each other producing things which in some cases were national brands of soda, but in other cases were their own local specific flavors and types. And that's what those are. On the right is a metal can that would have originally contained a fruitcake. <laughs> yes, fruitcake, the thing that everybody gets given for Christmas, or at least used to get given for Christmas. And most people didn't really like it, but it was something that you expected to get and do. Well, here is a particular brand that was made by a local candy company called the Hester May Company. This probably is from the late 1940s. And the name of the product, it says Hawaiian Hua Mea Ono Fruitcake. Hua Mea Ono means sweet or delicious fruit. So the use of Hawaiian language and the use of Hawaiian imagery, because probably a lot of those fruit were grown here, is perfectly okay, at least in my opinion. And now we move to two other products. And at the top, we've got Hawaiian coconut chips. This paper label would have been on a can. Uh, I suspect from the appearance of it that it probably was designed and first used in the 1950s, although this particular example has to date from after 1963 because the address of the company has a zip code. And zip codes came into use in 1963. Now, again, Hawaiian imagery, and there is a grass-skirted hula dancer kneeling on the left, holding very uh, kind of loving, lovingly and looking with admiration at a large coconut. I want to emphasize here that a lot of the times the products that are we're going to be looking at that were made locally, like these two, are not foods that are daily, that, that are substantial part of our diet. These are snack foods. And it's because if local foods were produced like rice, like poi, like uh, fruits and some other things like that, they usually didn't have to have attractive packaging. You just bought them because they were something you normally would eat. In this case, these being snack foods, they are on shelves competing with other products. So they have to look colorful and attractive to attract your attention to make you want to buy them. Below in this image, we see Royal Hawaiian Glacé Pineapple. Glacé is a French term that refers, in this case, to usually pieces of dried fruit that have had a sugar coating, like a sugar syrup. Well, 
what's important here is the use of the phrase Royal Hawaiian. And we're familiar, of course, with the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Waikiki because it's been there forever and it's a part, big part of historical Waikiki. This package, however, dates from 1925. That's before the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Waikiki existed because it didn't open until February of 1927. So where did they get the term Royal Hawaiian? Well, there had been a previous hotel in downtown Honolulu that was demolished or it uh, changed ownership and went out of business around 1915. It did in fact have a royal connection in that King Kalakaua had had it built in 1873 during his reign. It initially was just called the Hawaiian Hotel, but towards the end of its existence, it adopted the name Royal Hawaiian. That's where that came from. Well, and with appropriateness because it had had a connection to royalty. The current Royal Hawaiian Hotel has no connection to royalty. This product has no connection to royalty, but Royal Hawaiian is something we're gonna see continue to pop up as we go through this survey of what we're looking at. And again, the glass eight pineapple, what does it have in the background? It has diamond head, it has Waikiki, it has a alipili or grass house. It has a Hawaiian man with an outrigger canoe. It's using all of those images that people think of as being Hawaiian or representing Hawaii. These products, uh, the one on the left, this is obviously from a can of juice, it's a paper label. It does in fact say that it is papaya nectar from Hawaii. That means that the papayas were grown here and nectar is a term that's used for products that are not 100% a natural thing, but in this case, papaya nectar means it's mixed with water, it's mixed possibly with other flavorings, certainly mixed with sugar, and probably some food coloring as well. Leilani, Leilani brand. The name Leilani became nationally famous in the United States with the release of the song Sweet Leilani in the movie Waikiki Wedding in 1937. So after that popularity of that song occurred, people throughout the United States were very aware that there was a Hawaiian girl's name, Leilani. This product, I imagine, was in fact sold in other parts of the USA, and they're using the famous name and they're using an image of a hula dancer to emphasize that this comes from the Hawaiian Islands. At top right, coral light meat Hawaiian tuna. There used to be a thriving tuna cannery in Honolulu Harbor, not Honolulu Harbor, at Kewalo Basin. Let me, let me correct myself on that. And Kewalo Basin had developed, was developed in the 1930s as a place for commercial fishing boats to dock as opposed to Hawaii, uh, Honolulu Harbor. And this label, which would have been on a can of tuna, and we're still familiar with a can of tuna it looks like today, does use uh, an image of Diamond Head, but that's because it does. In fact, it was caught. The, the fish were caught in the waters off the island of Oahu and further away in the Hawaiian Islands, and they were canned here. So using that image is legitimate. And now at the bottom, that right in that in the bottom right corner, there's a circular label for something called Royal Hawaiian Pineapple Lay. Well, this comes from the same company that I just showed you the Glacé Pineapple Box from, which is the Mid-Pacific Candy Company. I'm not exactly sure what this Hawaiian Lay product was, but I find it interesting that the word Lay has on either side of it the words pronounced Lay, L-A-Y, so that if this was sent to somebody, it was bought by a, if it was bought by a tourist locally, taken back to the United States, or if this was something sent to somebody elsewhere in the US, they'd understand what the word lay, how to at least say the word lay. And you'll see there is, interestingly, again, imagery that, that shows that this person knew about Hawaiian culture, because you'll see there's the Hawaiian crest, and it is encircled by an ilima lei. Ilima is a native flower, and ilima lei are often associated with something more special than just a plumeria or an orchid lei. They are associated with Hawaiian royalty because the color is similar to 
the color used for feather of, of yellow feathers used for feather work, which was truly associated with Hawaiian royalty in traditional times. So there's a lot of meaning to this if you know about it. And clearly the art commercial artist who did this was told or did know about that. Now, we're gonna be seeing a lot of stuff in this presentation that involves pineapple. The pineapple industry today is just a shadow of what it formerly was. Pineapples to begin with do not come from the Hawaiian Islands. They are native to either Central America or South America. Pineapples were taken back to Europe centuries ago, uh, 1600s probably, by Europeans. They were grown there in greenhouses or glass houses that had to be artificially heated because it was too cold to grow them. And as such, when a pineapple in one of those glass houses had a fruit, it was very special, very expensive, and really something that only elite people ever saw or tasted. So in Western culture during that time, the pineapple, and also in the United States when it was started in the 16 and 1700s, pineapples were seen as a special uh, elite thing. Once pineapples began to be grown here, by 1900, an industry began, and the reason it took off was because the process of canning was used, because fresh pineapple really didn't work well when you tried to send it on a boat to other parts of the world. But if you put it in a can, it could be sold everywhere, and it was. So from 1900 on, the Hawaiian, canned Hawaiian pineapple industry grew tremendously. Now you would think based on what I've already been showing you, and the use of this Hawaiian mystique and Hawaiian words and Hawaiian scenery, that the locally canned pineapple would have paper labels that would use a lot of this Hawaiian stuff. And if you thought that, you would be wrong. Because interestingly, the local canneries, and there was, there was more than one, would can batches of pineapple or would people or companies would order batches of pineapple cans from these canneries. And then the canneries would put those paper labels on for that particular buyer. Well, there are hundreds of different Hawaiian pineapple can labels, and only a few of them have any Hawaiian imagery because they have imagery for the company that was selling them. So that's a distributor, or it's a chain of grocery stores. And so all of these hundreds of labels that still exist from the 20th century usually are generic, American names and imagery. And the number of Hawaiian labels that use things like what we're seeing here, again, very, very few. So in this particular case, we see Hawaiian girl, and there is a Hawaiian girl surfing. It's a very unusual and interesting image to show a female surfing at this particular time, because this is from the 1920s probably, or even before that. The sunny scene label, was used generically for a bunch of different types of canned fruits and vegetables, but this is for pineapple, and it's extremely appropriate because, of course, there's a surfer on it. And finally, in the lower right corner, Hawaiian seal, which, like the previous Hawaiian lay label, makes use of this Hawaiian crest, which was created for and used during the Hawaiian the time of the Hawaiian monarchy in the 1800s. But again, not a lot of this shows up for pineapples, but pineapple association with Hawaii was commonplace in the United States. This is a label for what would have been a, probably a bottled beverage, probably, well, it could have been um, a pineapple crush, like I said earlier for the word nectar, is just a way of saying that this is a product that uses some kind of fruit juice but it isn't just fruit juice because it's got added sugar, it's got added color, it's got added flavorings potentially. But it does make use of, even though this is doesn't say anything about Hawaii, there is a tropical scene in the lower right that you'll associate with the Hawaiian Islands. And again, this probably was used on a bottle of some kind of material, probably not a can, but regardless, there already was, in the early 1900s, a very popular soft drink called Orange Crush. This possibly is connected to that. And the Orange Crush was sold throughout the United States. But 
Hawaiian pineapple got merchandised a lot, and it was used as the basis for a lot of different types of sodas. So in the upper left-hand corner is a 1920s metal advertising sign for Hula, <laughs> the Hawaiian pineapple drink. Well, interestingly enough, this product comes from a bottling company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You see at the bottom, John Graff Company. That's where that bottling company was from. And it had started in 1873. So it was well established in Milwaukee. We tend to think of Milwaukee as the source of beer. Well, Milwaukee was also the source of hula pineapple drink, which probably was just sold in a very limited area in Wisconsin because this one bottling company probably just supplied a small, a geographically small area. But notice they're using the word hula, meaning that people in Milwaukee know that hula equals Hawaiian culture. Below that, a paper label for a pineapple drink from Hawaii called Lula. Where did Lula come from? Lula came from the Rochelle Club Beverage Company from Mount Vernon, New York very far away from the Hawaiian Islands. And this label probably is from the 1930s. And on the right is the cover, a generic cover for a uh, menu that you could just purchase if you had a small soda fountain or a small restaurant, and you could use the inside of the menu to put whatever you needed for your restaurant. Usually this would have been for a soda fountain. So you could just buy these and put your own menu inside and it had a pretty picture on the cover that customers would like. And this is advertising a treat from Hawaii, pineapple soda. And the white circle below the words pineapple soda would be where you would write the cost of the pineapple soda that you would be making to serve to customers, probably in your own soda fountain. And I'll talk about soda fountains in a, in a little bit more later. Right here, in fact, is when I'm gonna talk about soda fountains. Soda fountains were found by the thousands throughout the United States for a long time in the 20th century. Usually they, they could be a standalone small uh, store, restaurant, if you will. Frequently, however, more commonly, they were part of either what we call variety stores or five and 10 cent stores or drug stores. And a soda fountain was a counter with stools in front of it and behind the counter, there was one or two people working, and they would make usually things like ice cream things or soda drinks for customers when they ordered them. Usually, the back of the soda fountain was mirrors, and above the mirrors, there would be a strip of signs, like the one that you're looking at right now, showing the different types of things that you could order. Well, the banana split was already really popular. Uh, starting probably in the 1930s. And here's a takeoff on the banana split, except this is the Royal Hawaiian pineapple split. Remember I talked about Royal Hawaiian? Well, here it shows up again. This is just a generic thing that you could purchase and put up with a whole bunch of other ice cream concoctions that your soda fountain could offer. But notice the pineapple split, which is promoted as a tropical treat in every spoonful, does include strips of a spear of pineapple, which would have come from a can. And then there is sort of like a pineapple puree. It's been poured over the ice cream on the right. And on the left, there's strawberry ice cream with strawberry syrup on it, topped with whipped cream and a cherry on top. That's the Royal Hawaiian Pineapple Split that you could have bought probably any place in the United States. Now, this particular label is kind of interesting to me. It is from Baskin Robbins. Baskin Robbins is a national uh, ice cream brand, and it also has its own ice cream stores. And it's known for offering 31 flavors, as you can see at the bottom. Well, this is whipped fruit a la Hawaiian ice cream. And there's a little picture of the three fruits that are in this ice cream, but they're all riding in an outrigger canoe coming towards shore on a wave. And those three fruits are mangoes, and that's who's sitting in the front with the paddle, papayas, who's sitting in the middle wearing a hula skirt and playing an ukulele, and finally at the back, 
a poha berry. That's what's unusual about this. Poha berries are in fact a native fruit. That's a native plant. It's closely associated with the place where it grows, which is primarily around Kilauea volcano. And in fact, poha berries were associated with Pele, the goddess of volcanoes. Well, poha berries are not grown commercially. So it's not like you can get a steady supply of these to go into a nationally available product sold by Baskin Robbins. I don't know if this was just a Hawaii only thing that was available or if it was sold elsewhere, how long or how much they made of it. Because again, you can't just get large supplies of poha berries to put in ice cream. Regardless, Hawaiian imagery. Now another product which is associated with Hawaii because it's grown here is coffee. Coffee is mostly grown in the Kona district in the uplands of the, the Mauka part of Kona on Hawaii Island. Kona coffee is internationally known now for being a premium special coffee that costs more because there's not that much of it. Here's a label from a brand of coffee for something called the Magnificent Coffee Hawaiian. And it's described as the exquisite taste of coconut, exotic flavorings, and imported coffees. Now, you would think that that implies that it contains coffee grown in the Hawaiian Islands, but that doesn't seem to be what it is. It just seems to be an association with a premium coffee that's already known, but not actually using it. And this is relevant to today because continuous, we see continuing a situation where the Kona coffee growers are trying to have legislation created so that any product that uses the phrase Kona coffee must contain a certain required percentage of actual Kona coffee. And it's not okay to just use those words if you're not actually using coffee grown in Kona. And I totally support this because it's a situation where merchandisers and commercial people are capitalizing and using something which has already been established, but which they're not actually buying any of that product and using it. This is not necessarily one of those cases that what we're looking at right now, but that's relevant to that situation. Chewing gum. What does chewing gum have to do with Hawaii? It has nothing to do with Hawaii. Chewing gum was invented in the United States in, 18, in the 1870s, and it uses a product from the, from the sap of a tropical tree, which is called chicle, C-H-I-C-L-E. And chicle is this rubbery stuff, as we all very well know, in which flavoring is infused. You put it in your mouth, you chew it, you spit it out, and then it's this sticky thing that's a really problem for anybody to clean up. Well, what's the story of Honolulu fruit chewing gum? Well, I think there's some various things going on here. First of all, this was made by a company from San Francisco, the National Pepsin Gum Company. And I think the name Honolulu fruit is probably based on the extremely popular and already very well established Wrigley's Juicy Fruit Gum sold throughout the United States, which was introduced in 1893. The National Pepsin Gum started in San Francisco in 1915, so this is much later than the invention of Juicy Fruit, but I think they're playing off the word fruit because that's already well established in people's minds. Secondly, in 1915 in San Francisco, there was a World's Fair, an exposition, and the thing that really, one of the things that really took off from that event was the, uh, were the Hawaiian musicians that played Hawaiian music. And that started, that was so popular that it started a craze throughout the United States. It's one of the reasons that a, a craze for Hawaiian music began. So probably the people in San Francisco say, oh yeah, this was popular. Let's trade on that Honolulu Hawaiian idea based on the popularity of Hawaiian music. And we'll claim that this has something to do with the tropics. This is a uh, display box for that gum. It probably dates from between 1915 and 1920. And notice that for customers in California, certainly, they realize that many of those people will recognize Diamond Head 
and Waikiki Beach with the famous surf offshore and a suggestion of the Moana Hotel on the left because that was the big hotel at the time. And San Francisco and the Hawaiian Islands have had a long connection since the 1800s with Hawaiian people going to live there, uh, people from San Francisco coming here. So there was that connection. That's what this is drawing on. Now, was there any other real connection to Hawaii? Well, we don't know. None of that chewing gum is left for us to understand or really know what it tasted like. But you can see in the gum wrapper at the top, there's a very prominently displayed pineapple. So since in, in that time period of 1915, there were not a let, yet a lot of synthetic flavors available for the manufacture of snack foods, the pineapple on the label may in fact indicate that some kind of actual product, pineapple based product from here ended up in the Honolulu fruit chewing gum. We don't know, but maybe. Honolulu fruit chewing gum was still available for sale in 1935 in San Francisco, but by that time, the National Pepsin Gum Company had been bought out or taken over by the E.C. Harvey and Sons Company. And by the middle 1940s, E.C. Harvey and Sons was selling a gum named Hawaiian Nectar, and that's the label that you see on the bottom. Was there a connection between Honolulu fruit? Probably. It may have even been the same thing with a different name. And again, they're playing off of the established mystique and desirability of Hawaii and Hawaiian culture to sell this product. Now, something else that has absolutely nothing to do with a lot of products, but which got used, particularly in the 1950s and 60s, was the concept of a luau or in this case, a Hawaiian themed party that you could have at home. Parties like this were really popular in the United States in the 50s and into the 1960s. And because of that, all kinds of publications were released by all different kinds of companies selling different products, giving instructions on how to have a Hawaiian party or as they called them, a luau. So what you see right here are three things from that time period. On the left, how to have a luau put out by the Swift and Company, well, Swift Company. And Swift is known for selling canned meat. So there's not a heck of a lot. I mean, that's stuff that comes from the Midwest of the U.S. But this is how to have a luau. And of course, to use Swift products when you do it. In the center, a giveaway from Foremost Company, Foremost Milk and Ice Cream Company, which is primarily based in the Western United States, but also, of course, sells its products here as well. And then on the right, let's have a patio luau. This is particularly crazy. This comes from Weller's Cabin Still Kentucky Bourbon. <laughs> no connection to Hawaiian culture whatsoever. And it's hard liquor. What, what has that got to do with a luau? And yet, it's popular enough that they're issuing a booklet on not only how to create the environment and decorate for it and what food you're going to serve, it's also, of course, what kind of cocktails can you serve using their product at the luau? And by the way, they're not talking about exotic cocktails, they're talking about hard liquor cocktails. This is also something with absolutely nothing to do with the Hawaiian Islands in terms of where it comes from. Uh, these are Diamond Head brand firecrackers. This is probably from the 1970s, this label. Um, what's the connection? Well, there isn't any. You look at the bottom, you see that these are made in China, which means it's after the trade embargo was lifted that the United States had imposed on China, which was lifted in 1972 by President Nixon. And then they're distributed by Compton Fireworks. Well, Compton is a part of Los Angeles. So I presume that that's where these were sent to. So they made in China, sent to California, then they're distributed, but they're using Hawaiian name and Hawaiian imagery. And it says first quality Hawaii brand firecrackers. Now, of course, we like firecrackers here. We have forever and we do blow them up, uh, certainly at New Year's, but, this is this wasn't sold. This wasn't packaged to be sold here. 
as far as I know, I don't remember seeing these for sale. Um, it's just, again, let's use something that people recognize and looks exotic. Now here is a product that has made use of Hawaiian imagery and a Hawaiian name for a very long time. And a lot of people will be familiar with Hawaiian Punch. Hawaiian Punch began in Fullerton, California in 1934. And it was called Hawaiian Punch because it did in fact use liquids or purees from locally grown tropical fruit sent to California to be mixed. One of those fruit flavors was orange and orange juice obviously would have come from California where there are huge orange groves. But the other, uh, the other fruits were papaya and guava and um, pineapple and one other one. Both of these paper things that you see here date from before 1946. So these are from probably the early 1940s. On the left is a the cover of a small leaflet that was given out to promote Hawaiian Punch. And on the right is a paper label that would have been put on a bottle of Hawaiian Punch. Now, Hawaiian Punch, when it was first made, was a concentrate. It was not ready to drink. You mixed it or you did something with it, but you didn't just drink it out of the bottle. And the label gives instructions as to what you can use it for. So you can use it in punch, you can use it in malted milks, you can use it as a sundae topping in which you just pour it onto the, onto the uh, ice cream as it was, and you can flavor milk. What it also lists, interestingly enough, it says may be used instead of grenadine, maybe meaning that you could use it as a flavoring in cocktails along with alcohol. What's listed as the ingredients of this stuff? Well, pineapple, papaya, other fruit juices, cane sugar. Pineapple, papaya, and cane sugar would in fact have come from here, almost certainly at that particular time. Again, this is 1940s. So there still is a connection to Hawaii. Well, Hawaiian punch went through, has been, is still on, is still on the market today. And it first was sold in 1946, the company was. And then by the 1950s, it gradually became a, uh, it, it had become a national brand. And since that time, I think it has changed hands in total a, six, a total, a total of six or seven times. And it has long been part of huge corporations. So it was bought by the R.J. Reynolds Company, which was primarily a producer of tobacco um, in the 1960s. And since then, it's been passed from corporation to corporation. But it still uses that so-called Hawaiian-ness. Well, this is a label from 1963. And again, if you look at it, you'll see it says Hawaiian Punch Base, meaning this is the concentrate. It makes 24 tall drinks, meaning you could mix individually 24 individual glasses of this stuff with the base. What was in it in 1963? This contains sugar, concentrated pineapple and orange juices, passion fruit juice, apricot, papaya, and guava purees. So again, where did all that stuff come from? Well, pineapple juice would have come from here in 1963, certainly. Passion fruit juice, there's never been enough of a passion fruit juice industry here to supply a major user like Hawaiian Punch. So this is probably coming from Mexico or someplace in Central America. Apricot, not from here, but papaya and guava purees could have been coming from here as well. So there still might be an actual Hawaiian connection. And now we move forward in time to about 1980. And on the left, again, another label for Hawaiian Punch. And if you look in the lower left corner, you see a cartoon character. Well, on the right, there are the two cartoon characters, which some people will still remember. They were created for television advertising in 1961. And their names are Punchy and Oaf. And the setting was the setup was always the same. Punchy would come into the view, come into view in this car, little con, cartoon that they would incorporate into a longer ad, and he'd be singing "Fruit Juicy Hawaiian Punch," and then he'd say to Oaf, "Hey, how about a nice Hawaiian Punch?" And Oaf would think he meant, "Oh, a glass of Hawaiian Punch, sure," and he'd say, "Sure," at which point Punchy would punch him in the face and knock him down. And this being a cartoon, nobody was actually hurt. And 
violence is funny when it's in a cartoon. Well, what I find interesting about these two characters is, even though they're associated with something called Hawaiian, they literally are white in color, and they don't look or sound like they're supposed to be Hawaiian. They both look like they're supposed to be tourists who happen to be visiting here. Why is that? Because this is a, a series of ads for the bulk of the population of the United States, which at that time was overwhelmingly Caucasian. So you want people to relate to your product. These cartoons, again, were started in 1961. They were used for television advertising through the 60s, 70s, into the, 18, into the 1980s, and then they reappeared in the 90s. They are no longer uh, around, I don't think. Uh, and Punchy, the character, was merchandised. You could actually buy little figures of Punchy. Um, on the right, the image you see is an actual drawing from one of those actual cartoons. These were done on sheets of clear plastic. And the traditional way to make cartoons, which is now outmoded, was every one of the motions that every character went through had to be drawn by hand again and again and again and again in order to create the illusion of movement. So this is one of those that was actually used for one of the cartoon, the production of one of the cartoons. Well, let's look now in 1980, what does Hawaiian punch consist of? And an interesting thing has happened. During the 1970s, there had been a lot of publicity about dangers of artificial ingredients in foods. And there had been some big recalls or uh, prohibitions of materials used in common foods. And in the 70s, one of the things that got a lot of publicity was something called red dye number two, which was withdrawn from the market because the federal government determined that it was potentially cancer causing. Well, this caused a lot of people to be scared of and want to avoid artificial materials and artificial ingredients. So what does Hawaiian Punch do? They start emphasizing real natural fruit juices. So these are parts of the label that I just showed you. And what does they say? with seven real fruit juices and other natural flavors really prominently shown right there on the front. And then the slogan, Go Hawaiian, trademark registered. It's seven natural fruit juices blended together for the refreshing taste your family loves. How much natural fruit juice was there in Hawaiian Punch? 10%. And they had to say that. The federal government was requiring them to say at this point, you got to re be real. You can't just say it's fruit juice. That means 90% of this liquid has nothing to do with natural fruit juices. And let's look at the ingredients. Water, sugar, corn syrup, those are both sweeteners. Then fruit juices, concentrated in apple or peach, pineapple, grapefruit, orange, pear, berry juices, passion fruit juice. And that's 10% of this stuff. Does any of that stuff come from Hawaii? No. The sugar may have at that point because we still had a sugar industry. Other than that, there's nothing connected to Hawaiian Punch. Do we get to say, as people of Hawaii, how do you get to use our name on something that's sugar and water and food coloring? We don't. That's just part of the deal. And again, there originally was a connection to Hawaii that's long gone by now. How did another way that uh, Hawaiian Punch advertised itself was through these things that you see right here. These are playing cards. So they're packs of 52 cards. You could play card games with them and everybody's holding a hand of cards that the other people are looking at and it's advertising Hawaiian punch. What do we see in the image that we see here? And these are all slight variations. Uh, the one on the right you'll see is a red drink. The others are a yellow drink, meaning that they, they're, it's called golden punch, meaning it's got yellow food color. Um, what are they using here? They're using a suggestion of diamond head in the background. They're using palm trees. They're using a beautiful woman wearing a lei. Well, actually, she's wearing more than one lei. And an abundance of fruit in front of her, because, of course, this is real fruit. These are all from the 1950s. Look at the woman. What race is she? Well, she could be Caucasian, but she also could be not entirely Caucasian. She has black hair, she has dark eyes, 
her skin has a little bit of brown to it. But again, this is like what I was saying earlier. They have to carefully think who they're advertising to. They want to be, they want to look good. They want people to be attracted to their advertising, but they can't be too different. And if you're advertising to a Caucasian population, you don't necessarily want to break away from looking like them. These are playing cards later on. These are from the 60s and 70s. And an interesting thing has happened here. The use of actual models takes you away from the fantasy of the artwork. And the models now are exotic looking because they're not Caucasian, but they're also more sexy. The woman in the center is intentionally dressed so that she is suggestive. She looks sexy. That little sarong is tilted down on the side. You don't see that she's wearing very much of a bra. Maybe there isn't one under there. Of course, she's showing off the fruit. Of course, she's emphasizing the fruit, but she's looking sexy. The one in the lower left has an interestingly suggestive expression on her face. It's not just happy smile. It's more like, I'm attracted to you. The woman on the right is particularly interesting. She was an actress. Her name was, and she's still alive, Irene Tsu, T-S-U was how her last name was spelled. She looks exotic because she's Chinese. She's ethnically Chinese. She was actually born in Shanghai, in China. She came to the USA at the age of 12 in 1957. And even though she, and she moved to uh, the state of New York. So she spoke English fluently because she learned it as a kid but she did have a slight accent that added to her exotic appeal. She was used in a major national advertising uh, campaign in 1969 and 1970 for standard oil gas stations. And she appeared in a number of TV shows and had small parts in movies. She actually also dated Frank Sinatra for two years too. Now, is she Hawaiian? No. She has no Hawaiian ethnicity to her. She never lived here. She was not born here. She has no connection. But in the general scheme of American mindset, she's exotic enough that, yeah, we can think that she's from the Hawaiian Islands, even though she actually is not. And therefore, she can advertise the exotic Hawaiian village. Going a little bit further now from what we just saw, sexy women have been used in advertising a lot in all different kinds of settings, wearing different costumes, et cetera, et cetera. What you see here are products that were created by a company called Brown and Bigelow, which was from St. Paul, Minnesota. And Brown and Bigelow specialized in creating these pinup girls, these sexy pictures of women created by commercial artists who they hired. And there are two artists represented here. On the left, that is Earl Moran, and on the right, that's Gil Elvgren. They put, they created hundreds of pictures like these, paintings like these. These are all freehand paintings. The women who were depicted on the materials created by Brown and Bigelow were suggestively sexy. They weren't completely nude, or it was suggested, but it wasn't shown. And these were products that were imprinted. This is stuff that individual companies could order with their imprint on it and then give it out to customers. And the customers were usually associated with some kind of a business. Those, it was men who ran all the businesses back in those days. And so these are sexy pictures of beautiful women that men will enjoy looking at. That's the concept. And then your imprint is on it so that your customers see Pond Brothers Peanut Company from Virginia, and they see Tom Sims Packing House Service from California, and they see Paramount Pest Control from Washington State when they look at these pictures of beautiful women. You can see that the two things on the left have uh, calendars on them, so they were intended to be used for a short period of time and then thrown away. So the one from the top is 1954, the one in the bottom is from 1958. Those two things are blotters. This is from a time when people still used fountain pens that wrote with liquid ink. And in order to avoid smearing that ink, 
you put a blotter onto the ink to soak it up. And that's what these things are. The thing on the right is the cover of a notepad. So Brown and Bigelow did a ton of this stuff. And most of the women had nothing to do with Hawaii or Hawaiian culture, but that was a specific subset of the total amount of stuff that they did. So there are a number of these depictions of, again, women who are not Hawaiian, they're not ethnically anything other than Caucasian, but they're wearing what's considered to be Hawaiian clothing. There were also full-size calendars that people put up on the wall, and this was something that businesses gave away back in those days because it would be up on the wall for an entire year and a customer would be looking at your name for a whole year. And the one on the left is from 1947. This is from a multi-page calendar where you tore off each month or you folded it back to go on to the next month. And this one from 1947 has an interestingly pretty overt sexual connotation because you can see that the woman who's tying on the grass skirt is completely nude underneath it. You don't see anything, but you can see that she's nude. That's pretty direct for 1947. The one on the right is a lot more wholesome. And interestingly, if you look in the background behind the woman who's sitting on a surfboard, which was associated with Hawaiian Island surfing being that, there's a suggestion of Diamond Head, but there's also on the left, a car parked on the beach. Why is there a car? Well, this would have been used specifically by, cust uh, by uh, businesses that serviced cars. So gas stations and auto supply companies, and that's what this is. This is a Napa car supply store, and it's in New Jersey, and it's using a picture of a pretty girl in Waikiki to advertise itself. And finally, this is a photograph that I find very mysterious. In this picture, which is taken in the 1950s, this is a clear advertising photograph. There's an Amana refrigerator. That's what's on the right. Brand new, shiny, great big, huge, heavy refrigerator. It has been taken to Waikiki. It has been taken to be placed next to the natatorium uh, in the park there. And the grass house that you see on the left is where the Kodak Hula Show was staged every week. So they had a setting for the Hula Show to occur in, grass house, surfboard, uh, outrigger canoe, palm trees, et cetera, for people to take pictures of. But what's unusual here is this refrigerator has a topless woman standing next to it admiring the appliance. She is bare-breasted. You can see she's bare-breasted, even though she's wearing two lay. This means that in the 1950s, this professionally shot picture could never have been used in mainstream advertising. So somebody went to a lot of time and expense and trouble to set this up, but you can't reprint it in advertising. There's no way. You couldn't do that now to have a bare-breasted woman in an ad for in a magazine or wherever. What did they use it for? I have no idea. They did sometimes produce in-house stuff just for selected men to receive. Maybe that's what this was, but we'll never know. Okay, that brings us to the end of this presentation, but I want you all to think about what did you just see? What are, are, are these uses of Hawaiian culture, Hawaiian language, Hawaiian imagery, are they acceptable to us if we are Hawaiian, ethnically Hawaiian, or if we're from here? Is it okay that our culture and our place gets to be used to advertise things which have no connection to us? Well, it's a reality of life, whether we like it or not. It's probably not as common as it was back in the past when these things were printed and distributed and sold, as I just showed you from the 20th century. But this is a reality of this culture and this place being desirable, having a mystique, having an exotic allure that people can use to merchandise their products. Thanks for joining me. I am DeSoto Brown. You've just been watching How Did We Get Here? here on Think Tech. I will be seeing you again in the future, and I hope you'll be joining me then. Until then, everybody, aloha.